Thank you, Praise Band. Good morning. It's wonderful to be worshiping with you this morning. Uh, here we are in the sanctuary of our church. We'll show you pictures of that in a moment. But uh, it is so good to have everybody with us in worship this morning. If you're worshiping with us online, and of course you are, huh, because we're not open, so why did I say if? But because you are worshiping with us online, we welcome you. We're so grateful for your presence and for your attendance. We have a couple of announcements. Um, want you to know that the coronavirus has forced us inside again uh, with the weather also being a factor. We couldn't be outside in the Rose Garden any longer like we were over the summer. So now we're back inside the sanctuary, but it's just uh, five of us in here making music and uh, worshiping God together. We are recording these services now midweek, so today is not Sunday morning for us, <laughs> but uh, we're doing that so that we have a chance to get the video all compiled and then put online for you by the normal worship time on Sunday mornings so that you are able to worship at a normal time. So uh, we wanted you to know that we're working hard to bring you worship services and other things uh, as they come along. We want to thank you for remembering your church with your financial contributions. Uh, it is amazing how you all are just stepping up to the plate and making sure that your contributions are coming in. It's, it's so humbling to... Uh, to serve among you and to to watch those checks come in and it, it's very humbling and I uh, want you to know how very much the finance committee and I appreciate you keeping those checks coming. God bless you all. We're going to sing our first hymn. If you have your hymnal handy, it's on page 553. We're going only going to do verses 1, 3, and 4. Or you can just watch the screen for the words and sing along with us, please. Praise band, will you lead us? Today we're having a, a theme that has to do with uh, disagreeing with one another and discord and trying to find harmony in the midst of us. And so I would ask that you join with me in the call to celebration. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen in all Christians faith in Christ, the Savior of the world. Listen to us, O Lord. Let us ask the Lord for the gift of unity and peace for the world. Listen to us, O Lord. Too far. 
I am having some trouble with my clicker that advances the screen, so bear with me a little bit this morning. Would you join with me in the community prayer? We ask you, O oh Lord, for the gifts of your spirit. Enable us to penetrate the depth of the whole truth and grant that we may share with others the goods you have put at our disposal. Teach us to overcome divisions. Send us your spirit to lead us to full unity of your sons and daughters in full charity, in obedience to your will, through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we go to a time of prayer this morning, I would invite you to be in prayer for Jolene Spitzler. Uh, Jolene is having hip replacement surgery tomorrow, or not tomorrow, well, it's tomorrow to you because it's Monday. So on Monday, she is having hip replacement surgery. Um, Mike Martins was supposed to have knee replacement surgery but the hospital called and canceled it because of COVID. So he will not be having his knee replacement surgery on Monday. Uh, Jamie Martins, which is me actually, <laughs> um, I am having sinus surgery on Monday morning um, for some polyps and infection that's in there that can't seem to be cured any other way. So uh, I'd ask for your prayers for my surgery as well. I know that there are folks on your hearts that you would like to pray for. We received word that uh, on Friday, which is actually today, so t for you all listening to this on Sunday, two days ago on Friday, uh, was the service of celebration for the life of Shirley Cron. And so uh, we ask you to continue to be in prayer for Charles and for the Cron family. Let us take a moment now and lift these individuals up in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and generous God, creator and giver of all that is good, we thank you for our many blessings. We acknowledge that all that we have is from you. We offer you thanks and praise for the beauty of the earth, for our work, our family, our loved ones, and all the gifts that we've been given. Oh God, you are with us always. In each dark hour, you are here. In each bright hour, you are here. Blessed by your grace, may we show gratitude by sharing what we have been given. Help us to place you, our loving creator, first in our lives by becoming more prayerful and more focused on loving and caring for families and for neighbors in need, by becoming less preoccupied with material things and our own needs. Oh God, help us to hear your call to be good stewards, caretakers, managers of all your gifts by sharing them for your purposes. Help us make your priorities our priorities and to put our faith into action. Help us plan to give back 
the talents, the treasures, and time with which we have been so blessed. Help us plan to serve our church, our community, and our world with your gifts. <coughs> oh God, we give you thanks for all the blessings we have in life. Be with us all in this time of uncertainty and fear as we struggle in the presence of the coronavirus in our midst. Oh God, we seek your wisdom and your grace and your healing touch in the lives of those who have been affected by it. May we all work together as children of God to do our part to protect ourselves and our neighbors from this virus. And may we pray together as the family of God the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we have uh, been receiving your gifts in the mail, <clears throat> We're not putting them on the altar, per se, but we are dedicating those gifts to our Lord. And so I would like you as our church community to join together with me in the dedication of these gifts. Let us pray. With joyful praise, we dedicate this offering, acknowledging our covenant responsibility to share your word and love all your people. Let unbelief be turned to faith, ignorance to knowledge, sickness to health, brokenness to wholeness, both in us and in our neighbors, near and far. Amen.
scripture reading for today is taken from Philippians 4, several verses. I urge Euodia and I urge Sintashi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. <clears throat> the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the love of, and the God of peace will be with you. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a story about a woman named Tracy Leipert. Now Tracy was a beauty queen in Virginia several years ago. And shortly after her crowning, um, she drove 250 miles to seek revenge on an ex-boyfriend for jilting her and marrying someone else. <clears throat> she took along with her a pistol, a hammer, lighter fluid, and matches. And when she arrived at his house, she rang the doorbell, and the father-in-law-to-be answered the door. So Tracy faked having car trouble and asked if she could use the telephone. Once inside the house, she took out her hammer and she hit the father-in-law in the head with it. <clears throat> she stunned him, but she didn't knock him out. She didn't realize that he was an ex-secret service agent. <laughs> so he grabbed her, and as they struggled, she pulled the pistol from her purse and tried to shoot him. Well, that's when the mother-in-law joined in the fray, and the two of them wrestled her to the floor and held her there until the police arrived. When questioned, she said she was driven to seek revenge 
because she needed inner peace. Yeah. That, I know you're laughing now. I can hear it. <laughs> now, the subject of my sermon for this morning is dealing with conflict, disagreements, and that includes the peace that transcends all understanding. And that phrase is found in Philippians 4, 7. And all of those phrases that surround it tell us that Paul is dealing with the subject of peace with one another. It has to do with the peace within. It has to do with the peace of God. And it's important to realize that peace means being in right relationship. So peace with one another means being in a right relationship with one another. Peace within means being all right within. And peace with God means being all right with God. So first of all, Paul tells us that we need to be considerate of the peace that we have with one another. But that's not the attitude that a lot of people today have. They're convinced that, you know, if you don't gripe and complain and argue and fight for everything you want in life, you're never going to get it. So you hear them saying such things as, me first, me first. Everybody else last. It's my way or it's no way. But in the church it's different, isn't it? I mean, after all, we Christians are saved by the grace of God. And since we all have that in common, we always get along with each other. We're never disagreeing, right? Uh-huh. Wrong. <clears throat> we do disagree at times, even though we're all Christians, and we all want to serve our Lord. There are still times that we disagree. A couple of years ago, <clears throat> a rapidly growing congregation sent out a questionnaire and it asked the, the members to fill it out, send it back, because they were trying to find out how do people feel about certain things. So more than 200 people did so. They complied with this questionnaire and then all the results came in and they compiled all the results. Now the one thing that the survey revealed most dramatically <clears throat> was that they were a very diverse congregation. For instance, some thought that they ought to go to the bank tomorrow and borrow all the money that they could and buy more land and more buildings because they felt like the church needed that immediately in order to grow. <coughs> now others <coughs> felt that they shouldn't borrow at all. And instead, they should wait and not build anything until they had saved up enough money that they could pay cash for it. Well, some felt like they were giving away too much to missions. They wanted to keep the money for themselves and use it to pay for their new buildings. But others said, no, we're not giving enough to missions. We need to give more. And one person responded that the preacher didn't preach enough on stewardship and ought to be encouraging people to give more. But someone else wrote, it doesn't make any difference what the subject is, the preacher always talks about money. Now that's a wide diversity. And it shouldn't surprise us because almost everybody has opinions on almost everything, even in the church. But the question is, what do we do with all of that diversity? Do you allow it to cripple you? Do you say, we're so diverse, oh, we are never going to agree. So 
therefore, let's just not do anything? Or do you move forward prayerfully, realizing that some are going to disagree with whatever route you take? Now, the Bible gives us some guidance on this. It teaches us that the way for the church to solve the problem of diverse opinions is to select elders who are in tune with God and also in tune with the needs of the congregation. And as they seek God's guidance, the decisions have to be made. And they pray for them, they get behind them, and they need support for those who are making these decisions. So let's take a look at our text for today. Let's read what Paul says in Philippians. I plead with Euodia, and I plead with Sintashi to disagree with one another in the Lord, or to agree with one another in the Lord. <clears throat> I got confused because I couldn't say their names. So, I ask you also, my loyal companion, to help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. And he goes on to say that these are really committed Christian women who have worked side by side with the Apostle Paul. They have had a disagreement. We have no idea what it was that they disagreed about, but there's something that bothers me about this. There's a letter to the church at Philippi, and in it Paul has dealt with some very important matters. So why on earth, here in the midst of this important letter, did Paul stick in there something so personal about the ladies in the congregation? Shouldn't he have tried to solve this problem much more discreetly, much more privately? Why so public as to discuss it in a letter that millions have read now for nearly 2,000 years? Well, maybe it's because it's important in the church that we communicate to the world that we don't handle disagreements the same way that the world handles them. That we're able to find common ground. That we agree to work in harmony with one another. Notice what Paul does do, and what he doesn't do. First of all, he doesn't take sides. He doesn't say, Sintashi is right and Euodia is wrong. Get out of here now, Euodia. He doesn't do that. And secondly, he doesn't pull rank. He doesn't say, hey, hey, I'm the apostle here. If you two can't agree, then get out of here. If you can find common ground, fine, but if you can't, get out of here. No, he says, I plead with you to agree with each other in the Lord. And do you remember what Paul wrote in Romans 12, 18, when he says, if it is possible, and as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. There's something else that Paul does. He appoints a third party to intervene. In verse 3, he's called loyal companion. And we don't know who he was. But whoever he was, he was a peacemaker. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called the children of God. <clears throat> One of the most powerful ways that as Christians we allow evil to flourish among us is to act in ways that divide the church. If we act in ways that cripple the church, then it won't be effective in getting out the good news about Jesus Christ. 
So it's important that we pledge to one another and to God that we will not allow ourselves to give in to the evil in our hearts and divide God's church. As we serve God together, we will be at peace with one another. And then, secondly, Paul talks about peace within. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. In other words, don't worry. Let God handle it. Someone has observed that <clears throat> worry is the Christian's most popular sin because it's the one that <laughs> we don't even try to disguise. Worry is so common in our lives, we're, we're not particularly ashamed of it. When we come to church, we, we say all the right words, crown him with many crowns, he is Lord of Lords, he's King of Kings, he's Emmanuel, he's God with us. But then we leave the church and we forget that God is with us and we forget that he's Lord and that he's King and we take all the burdens that we brought with us and we put them right back on again and then we begin to worry more and more. In Ephesians 3.16, Paul writes, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. <coughs> Paul is saying that even while we're wasting away on the outside, if we're Christians, we're being strengthened and changed on the inside. And in Matthew 6, Jesus talks about worry. Now, I know you've heard these words before, but listen to them again. Listen to how complete and how inclusive they are. Listen as if it was the first time you were standing face to face with Jesus and he's looking right into your eyes as he speaks these words. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat or drink, or about your body, or what you're going to wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single day to their life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor and spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? For the pagans run after these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Someone has said that worry is assuming responsibility that God never intended us to have. God will carry the burdens for us. We need to turn our worries over to God. And in 1 Peter 5, it says, Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. And finally, Paul mentions peace with God. 
verses 8 and 9 are verses that we need to read often because they're special. And in them, Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think of such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put that into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul is saying there are eight filters. Everything you hear, everything you see, passes through these eight filters. It doesn't make it through these eight filters, and it shouldn't be in your mind and in your heart. There's so much garbage out there in the world. That old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. That's true. So think about it. Can the movies that you see, and the TV programs that you watch, and the music that you listen to pass through these eight filters? Paul says, Put everything through them. And here's the eight filters. <clears throat> if it's not true, don't welcome it. If it's not noble, <clears throat> if it's not right, or pure, or lovely, or admirable, or excellent, or praiseworthy, don't let it find a home in your heart. And if you use these eight filters, you'll have peace with God. Jesus said in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. I have a very dear friend whose father was a helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War. His name was Orion Miller. And one day during heavy fighting, his helicopter was shot down. He was taken prisoner by the Viet Cong. And he was imprisoned for two years. Much of that time, he, he spent it in solitary confinement. For two years, he was never able to see or speak to anyone, just once a day, a small panel was opened in the bottom of his cell door, and a bowl of food was shoved through it. He had no Bible, nothing to read. He slept on the dirt on the ground. And during his imprisonment, he was tortured, he was taken on marches for miles with other prisoners. Many of those prisoners died on those marches. <clears throat> he held on to hope in his heart. He stayed alive by concentrating on putting one foot in front of the other, in front of the other taking the next step. And later, <clears throat> he said that if he didn't have the hope that God would get him through it, he might have given up and died as so many other men have done. And he said, the two things that helped me keep my sanity during that period were the hope that I had because of my faith and the Bible verses and hymns that I had memorized. One verse that really kept me going through all of this was Philippians 4, 6. Don't be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. And with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He said, if there ever was a time to be anxious, it was when I was in that prison. And if there ever was a time when I was finding it difficult to pray and to be thankful, it was on those marches. 
But I kept repeating those words in my mind over and over and over again, having hope that I would get through this. And Orion says that after his imprisonment was over, he was released. That he made peace with his experience because of his Christian faith. Because he let God do all the worrying. And he concentrated on giving thanks. And he made it through some of the worst experiences a person can ever endure. Do you remember the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples the first time he spoke to them after his resurrection? The disciples were up there in that upper room. They were fearful for their own lives. Their leader was dead. Their future was uncertain. And just then, Jesus appeared through the locked doors and spoke to them. And do you remember what he said? He didn't say, what a bunch of flops you guys all are. He didn't say, I told you so. There was no, where were you when I needed you speech. No, his first words were just one simple phrase. Peace be with you. The very thing that they didn't have was the very thing that he offered. Peace. And he still offers it to us today. Do you have that peace? Did you come to worship God this morning with that peace? Did you find yourself carrying burdens that are too heavy for you to carry? When this worship service is over and you get up from your TV or your computer, are you going to go on with your life with those burdens still? Or are you going to turn them over to Jesus? I know one who died on a cross for your sins. I know one who shed his precious blood so that you could have everlasting life. And I know that he's available for you right here this morning. You can have him as your Lord and Savior simply by confessing your faith in him and giving yourself to him. If you haven't ever done that, do it now. Open your heart to Jesus. Ask him to come in. Ask him to give you that peace in your heart that passes all understanding. For if we have that peace in our own hearts, we can strive to bring peace to the whole world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is number 568, Christ for the World We Sing.
And now will you join with me in the benediction? Let the love of Jesus be visible in you this week. We will pass on to others the love we have received. The glory of God will be seen in your actions. We will seek to let God's light shine through us. Amen.